Welcome to the Books and Travel podcast. I'm Jo Francis Penn, thriller and dark fantasy author, bringing you escape and inspiration about unusual and fascinating places, as well as the deeper side of books and travel. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my ebooks for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Hello, travellers. I'm Jo Francis Penn. And in this episode, I'm talking to Mark Probert about his motorcycle journey through Britain following the path of travel writer John Hillaby, 50 years after the original book. We talk about how the passing of time affects places and people. And we also talk about our own experience of feeling like we never have enough time, of wanting to see more and do more, and how the pandemic has only intensified that feeling. So I hope you enjoy the interview with Mark today. Mark Probert is the author of Another Journey Through Britain, about a motorcycle road trip through the back lanes of Great Britain. So welcome, Mark. Hi, Joanna. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you today. But before we even get into that bike trip, I want to ask about your previous career because you spent 28 years working for Ordnance Survey as a map maker all over the world. And I'm just I'm thrilled by that. It just sounds so exciting. So tell us like, what drew you into that career and, and what were some of the highlights? Well, I was basically very lucky. When I think back, I think my first sort of the first time I got hooked into maps was probably going back to my teenage years at school. I, I really loved geography. I loved all those field trips to places like Isle of Purbeck and Yorkshire Dales. And I just loved the maps. I think some people's brains just work that way, don't they? Some people are, work with numbers and some people work spatially. And I just loved, I love the maps. And when I first started work, my first full-time job, it was actually updating charts, marine charts. Um, that was in Southampton. But as luck would have it, I just saw in the, in the newspaper one evening that Ordnance Survey was advertising for surveyors. And I applied and things just fell into place. And I spent 28 years with Ordnance. The first half of that was as a land surveyor. And I worked up and down the country, literally from Land's End to John O'Groats, updating the various scales of mapping. Then I, uh, I left the surveyor, surveying side of it and I went into the R&D section. And this is back in the 80s. It's quite a long time ago now. And it was the early days of digital mapping. And it was very, very exciting stuff in those days. I mean, we all take it for granted now because we just look at all this digital mapping and aerial photography on our phones now, and everybody's got access to it. But uh, back in those days, it was pretty groundbreaking stuff. And then I moved into the marketing section for a while. And then I moved into the international section. And I had my first couple of jobs. One was in Latvia, one was in Croatia. And I was pretty hooked on on that overseas work by then. And then I was really lucky to have a couple of years or two and a half years working in Paris. And then uh, I left Ordnance Survey in 2003 and set up my own company and uh, carried on working abroad. And my sort of sphere of work was, first of all, Eastern Europe. And then it gradually went further east, went out to places like Azerbaijan and Mongolia. And then there was a period where it was all Africa, places like Zanzibar, Ghana, Rwanda, Senegal. Um, And then in 2016, I joined the World Bank and took on a whole new load of countries then and actually got out to South America for the first time and had a couple of jobs in, in Colombia. So that was great fun as well. And then 2018, 2019, I started to go into a sort of semi-retirement period where I started slowing down and picking the jobs I wanted to and spending a bit more time at home. And then last year, when the pandemic came along, I thought, well, that's that's probably the sign I, I need. <laughs> and uh, I gave up and, and became fully retired. And um, 
settled down to picking up on that jobs list of my my wife that I managed to avoid <laughs> for so many years. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I do find the maps so interesting. Like you said, um, when you started and all that, there, there weren't the online maps, but I still use the paper maps, the OS paper maps to do some of my planning. And I find it just almost magical the way there are these symbols on a, phys- a piece of paper that match the real world in some way, but in a way it doesn't. It's not the same experience looking at a map as it is to walk across the same path in real life so I wonder do do you think I mean you said at the beginning there that some brains love maps but do you think the maps change your brain like do you see the world differently when you look at a map can you almost visualize the reality or is it quite different yeah yeah no definitely my kids tease me about it but you know like some people will sit down in the evening and look at the newspaper I'm quite happy picking out a map and just having a look at it. And if it's somewhere I've been before, yes, I can visualise all those places, the, the, the symbols are the trigger to, to see those places. And if it's not somewhere I've been before, I can, I can sort of get a, an idea, a pretty good idea of, of the lay of the land, particularly from the contours, from the, from the uh, see the height and the, the hills, that sort of thing. There's a, a story in the book where I talk about when I was up in Scotland at the end of my stint working on the Land Ranger maps, and I had my Carno Reeves moment. I'm not sure if all your listeners will be aware of the uh, or familiar with the film The Matrix, but it's about a guy who lives in a virtual world. And there's one point in the film where he starts to actually see this. He, he realizes it's a virtual world. And he starts to see the digital files. He starts to see the digital world that he's living in. And uh, I had my Carno Reeves, the, 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 the main character in The Matrix, I had my Carno Reeves ma- moment up in Scotland. I was coming back on the train from Inverness to uh, Edinburgh and I was staring out the window and daydreaming away. I was sort of, truth be told, I was probably not enough, but I was in that sort of uh, strange sort of uh, semi-conscious, semi-conscious period. And all of it, well, for about two or three seconds, I literally saw the world outside the train, the world going past as a 50th hour Land Ranger map. So, or the I saw the the pylon lines as symbols. I saw the the train line. I saw uh, you know the, the woodland with the symbols, and it was just bizarre. And I sort of shook my head and said, "Whoa, whoa, this is crazy." <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. And no, I, uh, it, it wasn't so much that. It's just I find it such a strange thing. And I'm glad I've done some training. And people listening, if you haven't had any map reading training, it's I don't think it's that logical. Like, I think if you just pick up a map and look at it, yeah, sure, some bits will be green or yeah. whatever, and some bits will have streets on. That's quite obvious. But I, yeah. I do find that some of the symbols and some of the lines are, it's well worth just even, I did a day, you know, as yeah. navigation course. And it just gives gives so much more richness to the travel and also just again with our phones we do take it for granted now that we can just orientate ourselves or find ourselves and this is how now you get people driving 200 miles in the wrong direction yeah, yeah, they yeah, just yeah. trust yeah. the gps <laughs> yeah 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 it's funny isn't it i mean like yeah obviously through my background i always use the paper maps it's just sort of uh, seems natural but on the trip up from land's end to john O'Groats, i remember stopping off at one of the youth hostels and and talking to the guy there the the, the warden about maps and he said because uh, i was expecting to see a whole bookcase of, of maps and the guy said well nobody uses them these days everybody who comes here they're, they're they've, they've got them all on their phone they just either use their phone or perhaps before they come here they'll download something and print it off and uh, for somebody so used to using maps that was uh, a bit of a shocker <laughs> <laughs> quite strange right well let's get into the book I mean first of all let's talk about the motorcycle trip and also I guess even Great Britain because you've traveled all, all over the world so why motorcycle what was the attraction um, and I guess some of the the pros and cons of, of using a motorbike yeah, well, I'm not, confession time now, I'm not really a major biker. I mean, I do enjoy it. I, I love it, in fact. In fact, the first time I got on this, uh, the motorbike that I used for this trip, it's Royal Enfield 500. I had a test drive and I went down Shirley High Street in Southampton and I just couldn't get the smile off my face. It was just so much fun. It was great. But the, the main reason I used a motorbike was it was just practical, really. Just to give a bit of background on the the reason or the rationale behind the trip, my favourite book of all time is A Journey Through Britain, and it was written by a guy called John Hillaby back in, uh, it was published in 1968. 
And it's a story about his his walk from from Land's End to John O'Groats up to from Land's End up to John O'Groats over a, about a thousand miles and about three months. And I read this as a teenager, and at the time I was completely lost in it. I loved it, and 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 his style of writing was great. I loved the humour. I loved the all the things he talked about, the geology and the the, the social history of of the areas. And uh, I always always thought it'd be lovely to do that. And I did the trip by bicycle myself with my two sons on bikes and my wife and my daughter in the motorhome uh, 11 years ago. And I read the book again and I thought, wow, it'd be fantastic to do that, do that trip myself. Actually looking at the places that John Hillaby looked at, looking at the places he went to and comparing what he saw with what things are like now. And because some of the things, some obviously the prehistory, that sort of thing doesn't change at all. But lots of things uh, change, you know, out of all recognition. So a good example is when he crossed over the River Severn, they were actually building the M4 at the time. And, you know, we, we take for granted this this fantastic network of, of motorways and A-roads throughout the country now, but it wasn't always that way. So I, I, I And also he talks about the characters along the way and the regional accents, all these sorts of things. And I thought it'd be great to do that journey again, and to look specifically at the things that he noticed and see how they've changed over those 50 years. And as I mentioned before, I, I went into sort of semi-retirement about 2018, and I was, I was not doing quite so many jobs. So then I thought, well, I've got the chance to do this now. I can do this Land's End John O'Groats trip in the footsteps or following the, the route that John Hillaby took. And I did consider walking it, but then I thought, hmm, not really sure if I could do that, um, which is which is a good excuse, isn't it? Um, and, <laughs> it and, and a all, lot more time. <laughs> well, exactly. Well, that's exactly it because I, I thought, have I really got the nerve to come home after all these years traveling abroad and say to my wife, right, that's it now. I'm semi-retired. I've got plenty of time at home. Oh, by the way, I'm going to disappear for three months. So no, I didn't think that was going to be a, a good idea. So. I'd also cycled it and I thought, well, if I, what about motorcycle? Because I could get the journey done in two or three weeks. I'd still be fairly, you know, out there in the open, smelling the, uh, the flowers and it would, it would be just a great experience. So that, that's how it came about, really. And so what, what are, I mean, because I don't ride motorbikes. My husband does, though. And we, we recently watched the Ewan McGregor series, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, Long yeah. Way Up yeah. and Down and yeah. Around and all of that. And uh, and what you mentioned fun there, and that's what my husband says too. It's like it, it can, it, it seems like motorbiking is either really fun, like there's a gorgeous day, the weather's great, the roads are great, yeah. you know, these lovely sweeping turns. And he's exactly. like, that is the dream. And then exactly. there is, that. it's either that or it's British weather, raining, cold, miserable, traffic, yeah. dangerous, terrible. So I, what yeah. are your feelings on the pros and cons? Well, I try and avoid the latter. And and, uh, if you just, plan to go at a certain point, you kind of you have to just move on. Well, ex- exactly. And I, I was so lucky with my trip because it was just fabulous weather almost all the way. I think I had one solid day of rain in the middle of that trip from Land's End to Johnny Groves. The rest of it was fabulous weather. And I was so, so lucky. And then one day that it really chucked it down, I was within striking distance of home, I was, which is Oswestry in Shropshire. So I just came home. <laughs> I spent the night at home and then carried on again. So it just, I was exceptionally lucky. And if you get that sort of weather, parts of this country are just unbeatable. You know, the the scenery of Cornwall and Devon and the Peak District, Yorkshire Dales, the Scottish Highlands. If you get the weather right, I mean, you don't need to go anywhere else. It's just, it's just amazing. Mm. so give us some specifics like what were some of the highlights well it's always difficult isn't it because as soon as you choose something you realize other things you've missed out but um Cornwall and Devon were brilliant because a it was the start of the trip so I was you know super excited by the whole thing as I mentioned the weather was amazing and it's also an area where my wife and I lived for a few years when we first started uh, started our uh, family. Our oldest son we, we spent his first three years being brought up in Cornwall, so that was that was nice reliving some of those or going to some of those places that I've been to before. 
And, and of course, the, the coastal scenery of Cornwall is just uh, incredible, isn't it? Mm. Um, and one of the things I remember at the start of that trip was it was mid-May and the whole trip, I, I couldn't obviously follow the the footpaths that John Hillaby had taken. So I I planned my route as near as I could to his route and went through the book page by page and, and followed his route. And I picked out all the back lanes and the minor roads I hardly touched any sort of even B roads, let alone A roads or motorways. And the thing I remember from that first part was the the verges of, of the roads were absolutely thick with cow parsley, bluebells, foxgloves, uh, honeysuckle. It was just fabulous, that first bit. Uh, so that sticks in the mind. Another bit I really enjoyed, and I always enjoy going there, is the Y Valley. I don't know if you know it, mm, Joanna, because yeah. it's not too far from you, is it? Yeah, but exactly. Yeah. I absolutely love that because it's so peaceful and tranquil. I think it's because the river there is just slowing down and it drags you to that sort of pace. <laughs> you go, it, you, you just slow down. And, and the road is fantastic for a motorcycle because you just sort of are making a weaving motion with my hand here which probably isn't coming over well in a podcast (laughs) is it (laughs) but but it's just a lovely gentle sway from side to side and you've got that tunnel of trees and then you've got Tintern Abbey it's just fabulous I always enjoy going to the Yorkshire Dales that's got many happy memories and it's again fabulous scenery I love the borders the border areas of Scotland and the area another another one that's a favourite of mine is is the Highlands and the the very last bit of the trip was on the NC five hundred um, trip you know, which people call the the British Route sixty six and as I said the weather was fabulous and you just can't beat that that nor- northwest corner in particular you're just going through very raw geological landscapes some of the oldest rocks in the world. It's very bare and barren, and then but then you come across these amazing little coves with white sand, and you think, wow, that could be the Caribbean. <laughs> it's just an incredible place to be on a good day. Yes, on a good day indeed. Yeah, Scotland can be incredible um, or, or not. <laughs> yes, but, yeah, yes, like I, I've of... seen I've seen plenty of the not. Yes, yes, <laughs> and we won't start on the midges. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, exactly. But it's it's interesting. I I wondered. I mean, you mentioned that John Hillaby talked about the social history, and yes. you talked about maybe some of the things that have changed. I mean, you mentioned most or all the places you just mentioned were very much the natural side, which hasn't changed. So, what are some of the things that you thought? Yeah, that has definitely changed. Obviously, you mentioned in the motorway but anything in you know particular towns or places you pass through that are quite different yeah I think one of the one of the most striking things was the decline of of towns in 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 Britain and, and that's been exacerbated even more of course this last year with the Covid it was it was really striking just how many of them were suffering and there were so many places where there were just shops with boarded up windows. And there's obviously a whole stack of reasons for that. There's the, 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 the ter- people turning to online shopping, people moving away from those areas for, for all sorts of reasons, moving to the big cities perhaps. But that was one of the, the striking images I had of the trip, just how much the, the towns in Britain had suffered. There was things like the change in energy. So back in the 1950s, a huge amount of of Britain's energy came from coal and that's that's all gone and, and now of course you see the wind farms all over the place it's something that John Hillaby would have never have seen so there's a whole there's a, I mentioned through the book as I go through and observe places just how things have changed in in terms of all sorts of aspects all those big industries the, the shipbuilding and the coal uh, even things like car uh, manufacturing they've all changed some of that's for the good and probably unless you're a a diehard miner, you, you probably wouldn't mourn the passing of the mines. <laughs> but, for, uh, for sure. And I mean, do you, what about the, I guess, the the positive changes, for example, um, food, British food used to be awful. And now we obviously we have a much more multicultural society. I bet you ate better than he did uh, on his trip. Yes, I think so. Yes, I felt quite guilty about that because when I, I I go on lots of cycling trips and I don't feel at all guilty then because I'm I'm replacing all that energy that I've lost. But <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't have that excuse on the motorcycle. But I, I started off playing a little game when I started. I was trying to pick up sort of regional foods, and I so I started off with a Cornish pasty, of course, and I had uh, 
cheddar at uh, cheddar and plenty of cream teas <laughs> <laughs> and I tried to change my diet as I worked my way up the country to keep it appropriate to the area I think I think that's awesome curry in Birmingham that would be ah, exactly one. yeah Bradford <laughs> <laughs> No, that's great. So what were some of the challenges um, or difficulties that you faced along the way? I was very lucky, really. I didn't have that many challenges. I had one major hiccup uh, when I had a puncture in cheddar. But, you know, in hindsight, even that was good because it gave me some great uh, things to talk about, so to write about in the book. It was quite an interesting little adventure in itself. The only The only downside to that was I had planned to be camping in the Y Valley that night. And instead of camping in the Y Valley, I ended up in a travel lodge in Taunton on the Taunton Bypass. So not quite the same sort of magic, but uh, it did have an interesting aspect to it in the way the, 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 way the story panned out. I, I think one of the things was one of the challenges is I, I planned it very well. I'm a, I'm a super uh, bit of an OCD planner and I, I, I planned it to, the, to, to into great detail, but leaving myself a bit of leeway if I needed to change things but I realized that I was always wishing I had more time wherever I went to I was always thinking oh if only I had more time here I should have built in more time for this but you know on the other hand I really wanted to to make progress and see other things and I think that's I think that's just in my nature I'm always trying to move on and see other things and you can't have it both ways can you You can't do that and and spend a long time and get absorbed in a place Mm. Well, it's interesting because I had just written down there the passing of time question mark before, just before you said that. And I was also thinking there, I mean, obviously that original book was in the 50s. You mentioned cycling this 11 years ago with your yeah. um, children. And of course, now, as you said, you're retired. There's a passing of time in your life as well as yeah. the passing of time in, in these books. And so to me, that that is an, a, almost an emotional challenge, which is we're facing seeing this memento mori remember you will die and if only mm. I had more time is one of those things you know as mm. I'm 46 what am I 46 and I'm thinking the, the same thing if only I had more time to do all the things I want to do um so w- w- was there that element of uh, emotional challenge as, as you you're in retirement and you're doing these things and also you, some of these are very physical things that you're doing and is that an awareness you have of the passing of time yeah a little bit I don't think I really noticed it on the uh, another journey through Britain but uh, I am conscious of it and I'm conscious that I've got so many places I still want to go so many journeys I still want to do and none of us know do we just how long we've got and I I I do deliberately try and keep myself fit and healthy and and I still like cycling I still do an awful lot of walking and when I go on these trips uh, I like to to do them well well the the India I went on a, a trip to India last year and you might say, well, there's a, there's a, I went with a, a friend of mine who's also in his 60s. And, and on the face of it, that sounds, well, there's a couple of old fellas trying to get their way from coast to coast in India over five weeks. That, you'd think they'd choose a nice, easy way of doing that. But we, we didn't. We did it in a very, we, we chose just about every method of transport you could think of and, and try to have as many experiences as possible. And, and like the, Third, third class travel on Indian Rail is a huge experience. I can tell you. I don't know if you've done it, Joanna. <laughs> no, I, I have been on Indian Railway, but I went in the first class. <laughs> no, but, it, but it was. But we. But I was happy just to push myself into these things, and we we had a, a camel ride through the desert. It slept in the desert overnight, and I, I just love doing all these things, all these experiences. But you're right. You know, I look ahead and I think I've got these various trips lined up that I'd like to do. And I just think, well, I've got to get on with it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we just don't know. But then I guess that's interesting because, of course, the trip in India it takes quite a different type of planning to motorcycling through, yes. through Britain. But if people, I mean, obviously you're British, we're, we're British. If people, you know, people from other countries are listening and might want to come and do such a trip, given that you were planning it as a Brit, any tips for planning a, a trip like that through Britain? Well, I mean, a lot of the planning that I was doing was was dictated by John Hillaby's book. So I was following his route. And what I did was I, I, I just looked at his route and I looked at the places where I could practically go 
on a motorbike, so I obviously couldn't follow all the paths he took. And then I did lots of um, internet research on those those places and and made lots of notes about places to go. I didn't book up my accommodation the whole way. I just booked up maybe three or four nights in advance, but I had a route that I wanted to follow. I knew the sort of locations I'd be staying in most nights. And I throughout the uh, the book, what I tried to do was to keep three strands going. Right? So I wrote about my trip, I, you know, but I didn't want to do it as a just a boring, I started here, then I went there, and then I went there, and then I went there. I mean, I, I did I did that as part of the the book, but then I also put in lots of descriptions about the places, the people I met, and some of the history of those places. And then the third strand I tried to weave into that was the John Hillaby part of it, you know, what he had experienced in those places and what I found along the way. So, yeah, it was uber planned to some extent, but there was an element of flexibility in there. So, for example, when I had the puncture, I was able to stay overnight in, in Taunton, which was... 25 miles from where I started my day's travel John Hilly John Hillaby probably would have walked further than that but but because I was on a motorbike I was able to make up the ground the next day and that gave me a bit of flexibility that um, I probably wouldn't have had if I was if I was walking and I mean obviously you've mentioned there that you've got lots of trips planned and lots of things you want to do but has the pandemic changed your opinion on travel at all are we going to go back to how we used to do things to what do you think will change well my my appetite for travel certainly hasn't changed I mean every Sunday when I look at the travel pages in the papers I just think wow I want to go there and when I listen to your podcasts I think <laughs> <Me too. laughs> I just think wow that's amazing I remember you had one a, a few weeks back with a guy talking about uh, Sichuan yes. and Tibet yeah. and uh, to begin with, I was thinking, oh, I don't know much about that. I'll, I'll listen anyway, just to see what it's like. And then by about halfway, I was thinking, I need to go there. That, that sounds amazing. <laughs> and and you had somebody on, you had Katerina on talking about Vienna, didn't you? And, yes, uh, absolutely. I'm going to Vienna oh, this, once I can, once we yeah. are. But it's funny, I feel the same way. I feel like I don't want to change the way I want to travel but then I guess I've always been someone who is is tries to be respectful in my travel yes. I think a lot of the stuff about mindless travel that might change but you and people listening and I think you know the guests on this show I think we're all pretty mindful about our travel yes. anyway yes yes yeah so so my appetite's certainly not changed I mean practically we haven't been able to do it have we mm. so I've I've done lots and lots of walking we're very fortunate be, because we live in some beautiful Shropshire countryside and I've just explored all the lanes around her. I've just been everywhere around within a sort of I don't know five seven mile range of here and uh, I've just been out pretty much every day walking I, I've, I've done over well nearly 400 miles I'd say this year just walking around the lanes around here just getting out every day so I mean, even that is fantastic because you get out into the nature and you see the changing seasons. And even though we've had our wings clipped in terms of going abroad, there's there's still things you can do. You can still get out there and do things, can't you? Mm. Yeah, and I feel like maybe we I don't know if I did take it for granted but I think that I'm going to be even more grateful when we are back out in the world and I don't want yeah. to forget this period I feel like it's very important that we remember how it felt to not be able to travel you know what I, I mean? agree I absolutely I think we did take it for, well I think I know I took it for granted because it was my it was my job for many years and I mm. would just jump on a plane and go somewhere halfway around the world and I'll be working there for two or three weeks and I'd just jump on a plane and come back again. It was just a way of life. And you just take that for granted. And I mean, I was very lucky in a way that the pandemic came at a time when I was packing up work anyway. I mean, if I was in the middle of my career and that happened, you know, I might see things differently. But it, it wasn't such a, a tough thing for me. It, you know, if anything, it was in some ways a good thing because it made me say, right, I'm going to stop now and move on to the next chapter. And then just uh, while you were doing the trip, so obviously you're on a motorbike, your hands are on on the handlebars and you're, yep. you're concentrating. So how did you record it in order to write the book? Were you writing a journal in the evening or did you stop to take photos or how did you actually log the trip as you did it? Yeah, but, well, bits of all of that. I had I was actually writing a blog along the way. I mentioned that my um, my family did the Land's End John Groats bike ride back in 
in 2010. And for the few years after that, my two sons and I did some other very long distance uh, bike rides. So we went down to Milan one year and cycled back home. Another year we went from end to end in Ireland. And another year we went across the Pyrenees. And each time we did that, the two, my two sons would, would do a, a film of it and, and they'd write up a, a blog and, and report every day on, on our progress. So when I did my Land's End John O'Groats trip, I thought, well, I might not be able to manage all the filming, but at least I can keep a blog. So, and so I did that and uh, took thousands of pictures. I don't think it's any, any exaggeration to say it was thousands. So at the end of the day, and it was a bit of a pain if I'm, if I'm being honest, I would sit down and I would go through the, the day's events, write it up on the blog, write up a few other notes, pick out a few photographs to put on the blog. So I had my diary being built up day by day through that method. And then when it came to write the book, I was able to take out quite a bit of that blog content and put it into Word. And, and it was my starting point. It was sort of framework for the book. And it's interesting because uh, I had, uh, I think it was the last show uh, with Steve on hidden travel. Mm. And we were reflecting on whether actually knowing that you're going to report on something, say with photos or a blog post, changes your experience of it. As in what you're actually doing is curating for an audience almost first. So how do you feel about that? Yeah, I heard that. I heard that. and It was really interesting. He was talking about... Uh, the moments wasn't he and and Mm. and the photos and I must admit I have got a bit sucked into that because I can remember riding along on the bike and then coming around a corner and and I would say wow that's an amazing photo I'm gonna have to stop that would look great in the blog and I and then I felt guilty about it I thought well I shouldn't be doing that I should be enjoying the moment I should be just seeing it for what it is and enjoying it at that time rather than always thinking, well, what's going to make a good photo and, and what's going to come look good in the blog? I think we're all a bit, well, a lot of us are, are guilty of that, aren't we? And, mm. and I, I try and fight against it, but it, it's definitely there. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny because I, I also swing backwards and forwards, but equally, <clears throat> what? Uh, so I went to Bristol. I mean, you know Bristol. It's not very far yeah. from where I am in Bath. And the suspension bridge, my mum lives in that area. Yeah. And I've seen the suspension bridge many, many times. I went to school in Bristol. But what I now try and do, I think what is almost a good thing is that I try and see it with the eyes of of an outsider which is yes. most of the people looking at my Instagram feed for example are not yeah. don't know Bristol don't know this is Venture Bridge think that actually that's really interesting or like you mentioned the bluebells on a on a, yeah, you know, yeah, a, yeah. a sort of side yeah. road is interesting to someone who doesn't see bluebells in their area so I in my mind part of our ecosystem of people who love travel is sharing what might be ordinary for us or that we are actually loving and enjoying so that other people can experience that too so I'm trying I'm seeing it as a positive thing yeah and also yeah. some sometimes the emotional side of stuff side of it doesn't reflect in the photo anyway so you for example you might be in a beautiful place but you might feel really lonely or just yeah. really sick or something so I think the emotional, what you're doing in your book is reflecting emotionally on a place, not just with a picture, I guess. Yeah, it's interesting what you say there, Joanna, because I, yeah, most of the days, as I say, now I go out and have a walk around the lanes and and I'll quite often take a a photo. I mean, just recently, all the daffodils coming out and the, the spring lambs, it's been amazing. And I'll stick that on Twitter or Instagram without really, you know, thinking of any great purpose, but I take encouragement from what you say, Joanna, if it's giving other people an enjoyment of something that they wouldn't see typically on a day-to-day basis, that, that can only be good. Yeah, exactly. Actually, I've enjoyed your photos too. So, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I have daffodils. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> um, let's get into the book recommendation. So obviously you've talked about A Journey Through Britain yeah. uh, as your sort of number one book. Yeah. But uh, can you recommend a few other books about travel that you love? Yes, the John Hellaby one's a must, isn't it? But what I uh, tried to do when I was working abroad, if I knew I was going to be in a, in a country for, I don't know, maybe three or four weeks, I would try and get a book about that country uh, and start reading it before I went. And I'd read a bit while I was there, just to give me a flavour of what it was all about and get me in the swing of, of or you know, the, the mood of that country. So I'm going to give you some examples of that. The first one is... Uh, a book called Independent People by Haldor Laxness. Um, I'm not sure if you're 
aware of that one, no. Joanna, but it was it's quite an old one. It was it actually won the 1955 uh, Nobel Prize for Literature. If you had to boil it down uh, to its essence, you would say it's about a sheep farmer in Iceland. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's actually a lot more than that, of course. It, it's about how this guy sacrifices many other things just to have his independence and bring up his um, family and, and look after his family and, and look after the sheep. It, you know, on the face of it, it sounds quite a, a limited story, but it's just a brilliant book. And it's quite a hard read. It's very harsh story in places. The, the way of life is extremely harsh, but it's a really interesting read. The second one, I've worked a lot in the Balkans over the years. And one book I read when, when I was out there was called The Bridge Over the Drina. And it's by a guy called Ivo Andrich. I think he's also a Nobel Prize winner, but I don't think it was for this book. And it's about a, a place in Bosnia. It's a little village, uh, maybe a town. And it's about this bridge there over the river. The, the town is called Visigrad. And it's about the life of this this town over 400 years. And it talks about all the comings and goings of the Ottoman Empire, the Austrian-Hungarian influence. So it, it doesn't look at all the... It, it, there's all these major things happening in the region, but it's just looking at the day-to-day -day life of those people in around the bridge, in the shops and the houses around that bridge over that period of time. And so it's a sort of ordinary people's story. Mm. The third one, I worked out in Mongolia uh, several times, and there's a great book called On the Trail of Genghis Khan, uh, uh, colon, An Epic Journey. And that's got by somebody called Tim Cope. And it's, it's about six times the length of my journey, but he goes by on horseback across Mongolia from Ulaanbaatar, the, the capital, right across to the west and eventually ends up in Hungary. And he has these strands going through the story, which are about, about the, the life of the nomads of the Mongolian plains. There's a lot about horsemanship, and he weaves into that all the history of Mongolia and, of course, a lot about Genghis Khan. So that's really interesting. And the last one I've got is a bit more up to date. Many people will be aware of this or will have read this, and it's called The Salt Path by Raynor Wynne. Mm. Oh, I'm and, glad you mentioned that one. Yes, yeah, and it, it's really interesting for people who haven't read it yet. It's about a person. It's, a, it's the author and her husband lose their home through no fault of their own. They're in the fifties, and then the guy has a diagnosis of a terminal illness, and their sort of response to this is to go on, to set off on a walk, and they walk around the the southwest coastal path. And uh, I can't give any spoilers because I haven't finished it myself yet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I'm loving it so far. Well, and that book is a great example. And I think the reason it's, it's won here in the UK, it's won many awards and is doing really well. Mm, I think that's an mm. example of this emotional resonance yes. that, that travel, I think, has. And I mean, you mentioned it. I mean, a, a, a good travel book is not just I went here and then I went here yes. and I went here. It has to have other depth to it. And it's so interesting, isn't it? I mean, uh, obviously, we're not going to get too deep and meaningful today. But way back, I was married the first time and my husband uh, left me. And of course, I was devastated. And my mm -hmm. my choice was to leave and go traveling in Egypt. <laughs> Well, because, that's the obvious choice, John. Yeah, obviously. Because <laughs> and it's so funny because when you mentioned that, I thought of it about it again because maybe that's something about our character is mm. that travel is obviously we love travel for the experience, but I feel mm. like travel is a is everything. It's a way to heal. It's a way to, mm. like you said, you want to keep moving, and I feel yeah, the same yeah. way. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking of this emotional side of it. The the trip I had to to India last year had a very nice sort of finale to it because we travelled from Mumbai in the west and we went on a very strange circuitous route across to Calcutta at the at the end. But then I popped over to Bangladesh, or we popped over to Bangladesh for um, a couple of days because my mum and dad actually met when they were in India, and and it's now Bangladesh. And my father was in the RAF. This was at the end of the war, Second World War. My father was in the RAF and he, he commanded a, um, a group of air sea rescue boats. 
And my mum was in the Red Cross and they met out in India and then they came back to Britain and got married. And a few years later, there was me. So I, <laughs> I've, it was almost like a pilgrimage. You've had a couple of uh, podcasts recently about pilgrimages. Mm-hmm. It was a very emotional trip for me to go back to see that place where they met and, and where things started off for them. It was very, very moving. Oh, that's great. Right. So where can people find you and your book online? Right. Well, my website is my initials and my name. It's mgprobert.com. I have a a Facebook page, which is Mark Probert Author. And my Twitter account is at mgprobert. And for consistency, my Instagram is (laughs) mgprobert. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Mark. That was great. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking me, Jana. Thanks for joining me today on the Books and Travel podcast. I hope you found a moment of escape. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my books for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Happy travels until next time.